Mark 16, verses 1 to 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they could go and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? Looking up, they observed that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. They were amazed and alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he told them. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He's been resurrected. He's not here. See the place where they put him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. He's going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there just as he told you. So they went out and started running from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray and then we're going to spend a little bit of time in that passage. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, We thank you for Mark, uh, who's written such a concise account uh, of the life, death and resurrection of your son, Jesus. Uh, Father, today we come to the end of that account and in a simple way, Mark has brought us face to face with a fact we've got to deal with. Your son, Jesus, is alive. Father, thank you that we can meet this fact face to face. Please help us to think deeply about what this means for us as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. I think it's pretty rare, unless my reading is very narrow, I think it's pretty rare for someone to argue against the fact that Jesus died. There might be a lot of debate about who he is. There might be a lot of debate about his claims, about the meaning of the stuff he did and what it meant for him to die, but no one seems to doubt that he died. In fact, if you go back a little further in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 15, verse 33, when it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, look, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, fixed it on a root, offered him a drink and said, Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. But Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed his last. Well, just as Jesus said, just as Jesus intended, just as the religious authorities had planned, Jesus was arrested, rejected, tried and died. And I don't think there's any debate too about the fact that he was buried. If you've got your Bibles there, look at Mark chapter 15, verse 42, when it was already evening because it was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, came and boldly went into Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had already died. And when he found out from the centurion, he gave the corpse to Joseph. After he bought some fine linen, he took him down, wrapped him in the linen. Then he placed him in a tomb, cut out of the rock, rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Now Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were watching where he was placed. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. Witnesses to both. Witnesses to both. There in verses 40 through 41, witnesses, including the women who'd been connected to Jesus there with the burial notes in verse 47, people were watching. They saw where he was buried. They'd seen that he died. Undeniable, it seems to me. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. It's a fact and a fact. And Jesus himself had said so as many times. In fact, if you remember from last week, at least three times recorded in Mark. Each time he said, I'll go to Jerusalem, I'll be rejected, I'll be arrested, I'll be tried, I will die. Everyone forgets the last bit, don't they? Because each time he says that, he says something a little extra, doesn't he? I will rise 
after three days. Well, Mark continues his biography of Jesus after his death and burial because of those words. And we've come to the moment where those words are tested or proven. As we do, I want us to recognise three simple things. If you look there in your Bibles, Mark's ending is contested. It's argued about. It's a very short ending, isn't it? It really just goes to verse 8. A lot of people have debated. If you think I print off a lot of stuff on paper, others have printed a lot of stuff on paper about this stuff. On the one hand, people say, well, we've lost the original ending. Someone chopped it off, wasn't delivered. On the other hand, people say, well, Mark was going to get round to it. You know, he put it down after breakfast and then, like us, he got distracted and someone took it to the printers and off they ran. Secondly, Mark's ending is abrupt and strange. It does end suddenly, doesn't it? It's not how I would end a gospel. The women leave, they're silent, they're afraid. Do you notice it doesn't tell us what to do? It doesn't tell us how to respond? It just ends like that, with frightened women running away into the dawn and being silent. But if you look at the start of Mark, that's how he begins, isn't it? He's very different to the other gospels. He starts abruptly, suddenly there's Jesus. There's John the Baptist walking around doing stuff. So it's not an unusual ending for Mark, it's just unusual for us. But remember this third thing. The ending we have is God's word. Whatever it is, however it ends, our understanding of the Bible makes our handling of it clear. This is God's word and as God intended in our hands. I think he actually intended to end this way. I think Mark ends the gospel exactly as he wanted to. I think it is strange. It's meant to be strange because in its strangeness, it forces us to stop and deal with something that I think we get too familiar with. It makes us think deeply about it. In fact, if you go back and work very closely through it, Mark actually gives us some signposts. You'll see them there on your outline as the headings. He uses three verbs that stand out because they're different to all the other verbs in the whole passage. Every other verb in the passage is in the past, but there are three verbs in the present. Come, see, speak. Come, see, speak. And when Mark uses those present tense verbs, I think he's inviting us to come and stand with these ladies. Come with them. See with them. Listen with them as the young man speaks. So let's do that. First one. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they could go and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they come to the tomb at sunrise. Jesus is dead. Mary, Mary and Salome, it's not a band, but their witnesses had seen the death. Mary and Mary had watched the burial. The day of rest had finished. They'd prepared themselves. They'd purchased supplies so they could go and treat the corpse of Jesus. They get up early in the morning. The sun is rising, so they're not walking in the dark, but as it rises in the dawn, they make their way to the tomb. They come to where you'd find a dead man, just as you expect. We're not told their emotions, are we? We're not told their detailed conversation, though we're given a snippet later on. We're not told their expectations, but we know at least this. They've seen him die, they've seen him buried, so they go where they expect to find the dead man to pay their respects. And it's actually worth pausing and considering that kind of journey, imagining you coming with them. Because I think Mark invites you to walk with them, to come to the grave of Jesus where you'd expect to find him. If you've read Mark up until now, if you've paid attention over the last few weeks as we've delved into it, you would have been dealing with a number of emotions and expectations. His identity was very clear, wasn't it? He was God's chosen saviour of the world. The high point of God's commitment to roll back sin and bring God's approval. He himself recognised this, didn't he? 
Those close to him recognised it, though they mightn't have understood it. Jesus' mission was tied with dealing with one thing and one thing only, and that was human sin. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Do you remember last week? He came to deal with God's judgment of universal human sin, our attitude that says we think we can do a better job than God. Jesus came, as we heard last week, to be the perfect substitute for humans, to stand in for them so that he could be proven as the one fit to rule all things because he alone could beat death for people like us. And he was fundamentally misunderstood, wasn't he? Remember last week? I don't want a Messiah that dies. I want a Messiah that rules. I don't want a Messiah rejected. I want a Messiah who conquers. I don't want a Messiah arrested. I want a Messiah who's awesome, who kicks the Romans out, who gives me a seat at his left and right hand, who allows me to have what I have always hoped for, which is my own homeland and everything as life should be. There's a, there's a break there, there's a dissonance between what Jesus says he is about and what they think he is going to do. And God reminds them, remember last week, listen to him. Listen to him. And that's what it means to follow Jesus. It's to understand him as he is by listening to him and then following him, knowing that there's no one else capable of dealing with sin and now he's dead and I'm going to the place where I expect to find him because that's where dead people are. Come with these ladies. Join them in finding the dead man where you expect to find him and think about it. They were saying to one another, who roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us. Looking up, they observed that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And when they entered the tomb, they see a young man dressed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side. They're amazed and alarmed. You know how you go when you deal with stress? The easiest thing when you're stressed is to deal with the small details, the little practical ones, because you can manage them, can't you? I think that's what these ladies are doing. But like most of us when we're stressed, we only remember those details when we start the job, don't we? So they're walking there and then they think, oh, what are we going to do? There's a big stone. Who's going to roll it away? It sounds and smells like real people, doesn't it? Because we know that's what we do. A crucial fact. I've forgotten it. I'm so overwhelmed by emotion. I get to do the job and I remember, I've got to move the stone. How am I going to move the stone? They get there. What do they see? The stone, which was very large in case you'd forgotten, has been rolled away. Now, that's not usual, is it? Not as you'd expect. They'd seen the stone. Can you imagine the butterflies as they walk towards the tomb? They enter the tomb. They see a young man sitting there. The description given marks him out as an angel, doesn't it? When you hear long white robe, that's an angel. When you see that match with alarmed and afraid, that's angel. And their reaction is standard. They react like everyone else in the Bible does when they meet an angel. They're amazed and alarmed. It was going to be such a simple trip. Just some herbs, pay your respects. What are we dealing with now? Wide open to possibilities. We're invited to see with them. We're placed with that present tense, shoulder to shoulder with them as they see the tomb, as they see the stone, as they see the angel. How would you react? How are you reacting? Well, don't be alarmed, he told them. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He's been resurrected. He's not here. See the place where they put him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee, and you'll see him there just as he told you. Remember that command God gave, listen to him? Always worth listening to someone who speaks God's words. 
And this intervention comes at the right moment, doesn't it? An explanation of the things in front of them. And let me tell you, this guy doesn't muck around like some preachers. Short, sharp, clear statements. Here are the facts. Don't be alarmed. It's the usual response an angel gives. It's the calm down people in the face of angel response. Don't be alarmed. But recognize that this is an event that needs explaining. He recognizes who they're looking for. Jesus the Nazarene, the one who was crucified. It's a helpful statement because he acknowledges what they're doing. They've come to look for a dead man where you expect to find dead people. It recognizes the world they operate in, the world of corpses and death and burials and dashed expectations. They're not in the wrong place, but perhaps they're looking for the wrong thing. They're not in the wrong place, but perhaps they're looking for the wrong thing. And then he confirms it. He's been resurrected. He is not here. See the place where they put him. Such a simple explanation, isn't it? Stating the obvious, the tomb's empty. He's not here. What does that mean? He's been resurrected. That's the explanation. As simple as that. Just as he told them. Listen to him. He's alive. He's been resurrected. Have a look. And then the messenger gives him a very clear command, doesn't he? Go and tell Peter and the disciples that Jesus is going ahead into Galilee. He'll see you there just as he told you. He's not giving them this command so they've got something to do because they're nervous and twitchy. If you think about that command, it's actually a command that has a lot of promise. Because remember the last time Jesus hung out with Peter and the disciples? I don't know him and I'm going to run away from him. What does he want to do? He wants to meet these people who'd betrayed him, who'd rejected him, who'd deserted him. Isn't that the kind of live saviour of the world you want to deal with? The one who'll restore you, who'll reconcile with you, who'll forgive you. And notice the general rebuke, just as he told you. Remember, listen to him. So the women listen to the messenger from God. It's his intervention that explains the facts in front of them. The tomb's empty. Jesus isn't there. He's been raised. He's alive. He's gone ahead. He wants to be with you just as he told you. The facts are clear. What are you going to do with them? That's the implicit question, isn't it? What are you going to do with them? So they went out and started running from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them and they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. Well, that brings you up short, doesn't it? It's one possible response, isn't it? That's unique among the Gospels. Go back and read the endings of all the other good news biographies of Jesus. They all finish with the fact of the resurrection, and then they tell you what to do with it. In John's gospel, believe and have life. In Matthew, go and tell the world. In Luke, be reassured of what you've trusted. But Mark, he finishes with this. Women fleeing into the darkness full of fear and not saying anything to anyone. What kind of an ending is that? I think he means it to be sharp because he wants us to pull up sharply and to think about what we have just listened to, what we've just been part of. You see, if Jesus is alive, then his faithfulness, remember that? We looked at that three weeks ago. His faithfulness is enough for him to stand in for us. His life is a complete payment for the ransom of the judgment of my sins. He was not abandoned by the one who sent him. Isaiah 53 and Psalm 16, as Max read them, made that clear. God didn't abandon his son when he died. God raised him from the dead, a clear statement that the ransom's been paid. Your judgment has been served not on you but on him. Your death has been accomplished by the one who is like us, but unlike us, God's commitment 
is firm. He's dealt with sin and rolled it back. And the promise of restoration, remember that promise we heard when Jesus preached his first sermon? The promise of restoration is now shown to be true. Jesus has done exactly as he promised. His resurrection, his aliveness proves that our judgment for sin is paid and that he really is the saviour of the world. So what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? You've walked with these women. You've come. You've seen. You've listened as he spoke. Mark's asked the question, I love this truth because it states clearly in history, I think, that Jesus is the only one who can give me an answer for my brokenness, for your brokenness. Jesus is alive is a very clear statement that our judgment for sin has been paid for us, that our ransom has been served. So there are really two very simple ways you can deal with this, aren't there? You can reject it and reject Jesus or you can accept it and accept Jesus. It's really that simple, isn't it? I love this about Jesus. It's not complicated. It's a set of statements that make sense of life as we experience it and gives the only hope that has any foundation in reality. It makes sense of life because it actually deals with the root cause of my brokenness, which is what we expect when someone says they want to heal us. That's a reasonable expectation when Jesus says, I've come. We expect him to deal with the root cause of our brokenness, don't we? Which is our sin. So it actually deals with reality. I think it also provides hope in reality because it deals with the problem of sin truly and it deals with the horror of death truthfully. It doesn't build fairy tales based on being good enough. It doesn't build fairy tales based on the dream that I'll party with my mates. It doesn't build fairy tales that say, see that star over there or that butterfly over there. It provides a real hope of restoration because, look, the tomb's empty. What will you do with that fact? Jesus is alive. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. It is such a terrific thing to see an empty tomb, a tomb where someone had been buried and three days later had been raised by you to show that the judgment of sin had been paid for, the ransom was enough, that Jesus really has the power to defeat eternal death for us. Thank you for putting this fact simply in front of us today. Father, enable us to think upon it, to understand it, and in your mercy to grab hold of it and to know that our restoration has been achieved by him. In his name we pray. Amen.